Amen. So uh, the, the quick intro is um, local guy, um, makes it big in high school, has an opportunity to do something pretty rare in college. Um, he's in the Southern Conference Hall of Fame. Uh, he's in the South Carolina Athletic Hall of Fame. Ten years in the majors, ended at the New York Yankees. I mean, it's, a, it's an unbelievable story. And if you ever met Wayne just kind of walking through life, you would never know this background of all he has accomplished. Um, and I will tell you, it doesn't take very long in a conversation with him for him to say that it's about his glory, not his, not his it's about God's glory. And it's legit. It's not a cold punchline. It's legitimately the Lord's story. And so uh, we've talked several times, just kind of leading up to tonight in preparation, and we're going to do an interview. We thought like this is going to be the best way for you to kind of hear some things about Wayne. And, uh, and so I'm going to really just dive right in because Wayne is a, is, y'all give it up for Wayne. It's a blessing. To be here. <laughs> so, you know, coming out of high school, uh, you know, decorated athlete, power five opportunities to go. Of course, they didn't call it power five back then, but, yeah, right. you know, power five opportunities to play baseball anywhere in the country. And, uh, but there was something else driving your decision. Let's talk about what that was like when you went from high school to college. Well, I, I see we got some young people out here today and you know, that transition from high school to college, you know, it can be really smooth when that dream school comes around and all of a sudden that dream school offers you and um, you know, it's easy to say yes, that's where I always wanted to go, but that's not the way it happened for me. It was a little more difficult. I, I can tell you a few of my recruiting stories. Uh, my, my dream was to always play baseball at the University of South Carolina. Played for Bobby Richardson, who ended up being, you know, one of the lookups that I had as a young man. And um, of course, that didn't happen. And I always tell Bobby when I see him, you know, I, I went to see Furman and South Carolina play at Furman. And I was really excited to say hello to Bobby and the game got ready to start and Bobby was not at home plate. And I told my dad, uh, Coach Richardson's not there. I'm not sure I can play for him because the game's starting and he's not there. And I could see him down the right field line. He had a camera in his face. He had a blue sport jacket on. And he had probably been to the Fellowship of Christian Athletes and he was probably making, but for me, he was not on the field. So I told my dad, there's no use to sit here and watch this game. If that's what I'm going to get, I don't want it. So we came home, and when I tell Bobby that story, he, he goes, well, you know what I was doing, right? I said, yes, I know what you're doing. <laughs> but, uh, so then I had uh, Bill Wilhelm at Clemson. He, he recruited me, he recruited me hard, I would say. And so my dad and I took off down to Clemson, and I told Coach Wilhelm, I said, look, we're coming down, but I want to make sure you've got the football coaches there also because I want to play both football and baseball in college. And he said, done, we'll have them here. So dad and I get there, we drive in, we sit down, we talk to Coach Wilhelm for 30 minutes or so. And I reminded him, I said, hey, football coaches, you know, where are they? He said, oh, they're coming, they're coming. So the football coaches finally came in and, uh, you know, a little small chat. I can remember one of them coming in and say, hey, we really like the way you play. We really like the way you play, but, and I go, but what? <laughs> and he said, well, we've got too many small players here at Clemson. At the time, they had Billy Wingo, who was a running back, and Warren Ratchford. Uh, I heard Gaffney over here, Warren Ratchford, who was a great back at, uh, at Gaffney High School. They were both on that staff. And so I said, so you're telling me if I come to Clemson, I can't play football. And he said, that's correct. And I said, Dad? We have no other conversation here. We got up and we walked out. Now, when I got in the car, I apologized to my dad because I, you know, I probably cost him some money there, you know, and, and I didn't really think that way because what I really wanted to do was play football and baseball. So I'd been getting a lot of mail, a, a lot of things from Western Carolina University. And I just kept going off. I just, oh, this is great, this is great. Just really did do. So going home, I told my dad, I said, look, 
I think it's time to open that mail up at Western Carolina University and we need to go up there and take a look. So my mom, my dad, my future wife, Kim, we were all in the car. We went to Cullowee, North Carolina. If you haven't seen it, you need to go see it. It's a beautiful place. Um, we get there on a Saturday. It's snowing. Coach, coach White was the coach that was recruiting me, and he said, Wayne, when you get here on campus, I want you to go to the middle of campus. You're going to see a phone booth. Now, that's... That's how back it was. You're going to see a phone booth. And I said... You have to explain that to some people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. These guys don't know what a phone booth is. And I said, he said, now, when you get there, I want you to call this number. He said, you're going to call this number. And when you call, he said, I'm going to be able to hear you, but you're not going to be able to hear me. I go, okay, got it. So, sure enough, that's what I did. Bing, bing, bing. Coach White shows up a few minutes and... So we go on this uh, recruiting trip and, you know, they just won me over. The reason they won me over was really the coaches. We talk about coaches. Uh, Bob Waters, quarterback for the San Francisco 49ers, ran a pass-oriented offense, had small wide receivers, and all of them were successful. So that fit. They played on turf. At the time, there weren't a lot of turf. So that really fit. And then Bill Haywood, the baseball mm -hmm. coach, whom – I had never seen and didn't see on this recruiting trip. Um, he, he basically was the reason that the baseball was good because he was already working with the Texas Rangers, who, who eventually drafted me, by the way. So, uh, so when you start to look at where you belong and what you want to do, at some point it starts to crystallize. And that's what happened in my recruiting process. So after we... Did that, we went, uh, jumped in the car, started back down the mountain. The first question my mother asked, he said, you're surely not going to school up here, are you? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, this is where I'll play. And so that's how it happened. So uh, what, what you may not know is that um, in football, um, Wayne actually led the nation in receiving yards. Uh, and also, uh, very successful in baseball, and at the end of his college career, you had a decision to make because he was he went to the, uh, one of the college all star games in football. So and, and SoCon Player of the Year in baseball. So here you have an athlete that's rare. I mean, a rare athlete. The decision to play pro baseball. Walk us through that that choice because I know that was not easy in some ways. I guess. Well, you know, I, I kind of grew up in a baseball family. My dad was a player. He, he played in the minor leagues, played six years with Cleveland Indians. Never made it to the big leagues, but I was told was a really good catcher. I was told his energy level wasn't probably what it should be. And I think I might have got a little more of that energy <laughs> in, in my game. But um, I, I really came up in a, in a, in a, in a sports-oriented family. And what was the question? No, the choice of when you went baseball or football. Okay, so baseball was always a love of mine. I, and, I, you know, I just really enjoyed playing football. And so when, when you know, when it come, came time to, to make a decision, it was, you know, without a doubt, I was at the Can-Am Bowl down in Tampa, Florida. It was the first time Western Carolina University had ever had an athlete to go to a postseason game. And so I really didn't want to play, but I really wanted to honor what they had done for me. And so I went down to Tampa, long story short, first three plays of the game, I thought I caught three balls, three catches, three receptions, the fourth play of the game, that 12th man, it was a Canadian all-star game, that 12th man knocked me cuckoo. And they kind of pulled me off of the field. I went over, I sat down uh, on the bench and uh, the coach that we had had won three or four great cups. And I remember walking up to him and going, coach, don't put me back in. I'm going to play baseball. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, that was, that was when that decision was made for sure. Uh, I did have New England earlier in that week. I was walking off the field with a New England scout, and he said, hey, would you be interested in walking on with us? And I go, hey, I'm honored, but there's no way I'm going to walk on <laughs> and play football. So... Baseball became, you know, what, what I'd always hoped it to be, you know, the choice sport. So Texas Rangers, um, 
And you know, if, you, if you're into the sports world at all today, the big money is in baseball. And so that big money salary, that, tell us what you want to say. We want to know the numbers. Well, um, you know, I think I made the big leagues in 1981. Um, my salary was $43,000. So today, if you're a rookie today and your first day in the big leagues, you're making 700 grand. The average salary is 4.5. So I was making the minimum, which was 43 at the time, right? Sounds like a lot of money back then, not now, but uh, that average salary was about 450,000 back then. So, uh, you know, one of, one of the things is, is Wayne and I were talking, you know, growing up, you hear about a lot, a lot of baseball teams, but there's something about when you hear the Yankees. The New York Yankees has come like the gold standard in baseball. Um, share with them the story about uh, when the change happened, when you got the call. Yeah. I, I wanted to hear the story about when you got So, that. you know, in, in Major League Baseball, as you know, you're just a commodity, right? You're, you're available to other teams. And uh, I was traded twice. I had my best year in uh, 1986. Uh, down in Texas with the Rangers. I mean, just kind of a, a crazy, crazy good year. I hit 313, and, you know, I'm telling my wife, we already had a, a condo in Texas. I'm telling my wife, hey, 313, that's pretty good. Multi-year contract, hey, things are looking good. All that 313 got me was traded to the Chicago White Sox. There was no multi-year deal involved, okay? And so I, uh, I was traded to the White Sox. I can remember Tony La Russa again something about a phone. We had no cell phones. I was at my mom and dad's house and Tony La Russa, who is now a Hall of Fame manager that I was privileged to play with in Chicago, he called and uh, his nickname is T-Bone. And you know, we did some small talk and I said, hey, T-Bone, you know, you got Ozzie Ginn playing short. You got Julio Cruz playing second. Both were all stars. I go, you just traded for me. Where am I gonna play? <laughs> He said, you're my new third baseman. I go, okay. Now, I could play third. Don't get me wrong. I could really play third, but I'm not a power player, and, uh, and that's required at third base. So I remember when we finished talking, I hung up, I hung up the phone and walked in, and my, my wife was there and my mom and dad, and I said, well, guys, we've been traded to the White Sox, said, which I'm excited about because they had won the pennant in 84. And so, you know, it's, it's all about winning. You know, can you finally get there and get a ring? That's, that's what every guy's out there trying to do. So I was, um, I, was, I was very short with my family. I said, look, this is the way I read that phone conversation. We're going to Chicago. We're not packing everything we have because we won't be there long. So long story short, I played 58 out of 60 games in Chicago, I think about 260. And Tony and Russo got fired. So, you know, that's the way the game goes from time to time. So with T-Bone fired, new manager comes in, Jim Fergosi. Well, you know what happens in any business when new management comes in, right? Some people leave. Some people are forced out. And I was one of three that were sat down when Jim Fergosi came in. So it was, uh, it was, it was quite different. You know, when you play 58 out of 60 games, you kind of get used to playing, all right? And it's not like I was playing bad, but Fergosi didn't like me at third base. And I don't blame him because it's a power position. So here we are, you know, Fergosi's here. One week passes, I didn't play. Two week passes, I didn't play. And then after about two weeks, I'm kind of down on the end of the dugout and, and Jim starts walking down. We had only said hello. That's it. Only hello. And he starts walking down to the end of the dugout and I'm going, he's coming down here to put me in the game. <laughs> you know, he's coming down here to put me in the game. He got down there and he said, Tommy, that's my nickname, Tommy. He said, Tommy, he said, when do you play? And I looked at him and I said, every day till you got here. <laughs> and he said, that's okay. I'm going to make a lot of people unhappy. That's, that's all he said. He turned around. He walked back. So a week later, we had a four-game set in New York. 
and um, I walk in, we're in New York, I walk into the clubhouse and I look at the lineup, which you do whether you're playing or not, right? You look at the lineup and I go, hmm, hitting second, playing short. New day, right? So for those next four days, I played shortstop in New York. I kind of went off. I was very thankful. I kind of went off and uh, we got back home two days later after we got back home. So I'm back in the dugout. I'm sitting again. I'm back in the same place over here. And um, one of the trainers actually walked over to me and said, hey, Hawk, Hawk Harrelson wants to see you upstairs. I go, dude, we're in a game. There's nobody upstairs. Go on, go on, go on. I said, no, no, no. He kind of picks me up, walks me over there. And you kind of look up a, a stair steps, you know, to the top. And sure enough, there stood Hawk Harrelson. He was the general manager of the team at the time. And um, so I said, okay, I got it. So I went up and I said, what's up, Hawk? And he said, I step in here, <laughs> stepped in the office. And he said, I just want you to know you've done everything we've asked you to do. Okay, I want you to know that. He said, and the second thing I want you to know, and I want you to tell me is how do you like New York? <laughs> and I go, which side? And he said, pinstripes. And I said, great. Because as a kid, I've always wanted to play with the Yankees. Why? Because my childhood Yan uh, Yankee lookup was Bobby Richardson. Not the same statue, all that. So all of a sudden, lots of stuff starts running together, right? Uh, later on that night, we found out, and then tell me if I'm going too long, uh, later, later on that night, uh, he, he sends me back down to the dugout and says, look, the, the media doesn't know this, so you can't tell the players. So I said, is anybody going with me? He said, yeah, Ron Kittle's going with you, Joel Skinner, catcher, left fielder. And uh, he said, but you can't say anything. So as soon as I get back down to the dugout, you know what happens, right? <laughs> come back down to the dugout, here comes Ron Kittle, here comes Kitty, here comes everybody. Hey, what's happening? Are you gone? Are you traded? I said, dude, we've got a game going. So I couldn't say anything until the media popped it afterwards. And then to, on top of that, uh, we had to be in Milwaukee the next day with the Yankees at 12 o'clock. So uh, my wife had no idea it had been traded. Right, and so you know, she was responsible for packing up the house, for selling the car, for doing all those things. And then the next morning, we we head to Milwaukee. Joel Skinner and I are in the car together, and we go into Yankee clubhouse. First person I see is Lou Pinella. Lou's it's about eight thirty in the morning. Lou's already in his uniform, got a cup of coffee. You know, we shake hands, say hello. He said, "Hey, I hope you got some sleep last night because you're playing short and hitting second." So we, 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 played, we played Milwaukee that night, uh, faced Teddy Higuera, who was one of the better left-handers in the league. I vividly remember going two for three. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, playing shortstop like I should. And, and, and then actually went on about a nine-game hitting streak with the Yankees. And that's how I became a Yankee. So, you know, one of the things that, that you may not know, uh, there, was a, there was a pivotal point in, uh, in Wayne's life where he had a decision to make because he actually could have stayed on with the Yankees. They, uh, there, was a, there was a point of transition and uh, they wanted you long-term in the organization. Um, so walk us briefly through that because I've got a follow-up question. Yeah, so that, we, we uh, you know, every, every player comes to the end. I mean, unfortunately, you know, I work with a lot of young kids and, you know, we, we talk about how important academics are, right? We talk about all the things that are really long-term. You know, I tell you, you know, your school decision is a four-year decision. Your school is a 40-year decision. You're going to be there for a long time. So my career, uh, I was 36. Uh, Gene Michaels was the general manager. And again, one of the clubhouse guys came over and said, hey, Gene wants to see you upstairs. And of course, I'd never been upstairs in Yankee Stadium and got up there with Gene. And um, he said, Tolly, he said, uh, we're not calling anybody else up here. He said, we're releasing you at the end of the year, but we want you to stay in the organization. You know, we want you to go and, and work with the kids down in minor leagues. And 
I go, Stick. His nickname was Stick. I said, Stick, I am totally honored. Totally honored. I said, but I had a manager tell me, do not get into coaching until you're absolutely sure you're finished as a player. And that was actually Tony LaRusso because he told me, I'm coming after you when you finish. <laughs> okay? And so I told, I told Stick, I said, I am so honored. I said, I'll tell you what, Stick. If you put me in that dugout, pointing down in Yankee Stadium at the home dugout, I said, if you put me in that dugout next year, I'll stay. Otherwise, I'm going to try to play another year. Well, by God's grace, he said, that's not what we want you to do. We want you to go to the minor leagues. So that kept me from going and transitioning right from a, a player right into coaching in the major league. So kind of the way that happened. There was kind of a transition time there for Wayne. Uh, moves into a role of a successful businessman, uh, but it also allowed him to spend more time with family, which is one of the things that he treasures and values. If you've ever met his boys, you see the kind of high character young men, well, not young men anymore, but no. uh, I think still think they're young, but uh, there was a compass that was guiding Wayne through his life. And one of the things, I've, I've been in this community for over 25 years, and any time the name Wayne comes up, while there's accolades of athletics, the character and faith of Wayne is, is right at the tip of the tongue of everybody talking about the kind of person he is. Talk to us, Wayne, about uh, not that you're a perfect person, because you're the first one to admit that you have not lived a perfect life, but your love for Jesus Christ is undeniable. And the difference that that made from high school, college, professional life. Talk to us about the importance yeah, of that. You know, I, I think so much of who I am today is based on my faith, period. Uh, I don't know what I would do without my faith. I don't know where I would have ended up. I don't know what that baseball career would have looked like. Um, so, so much of who I am is based on my faith. And I, I think that as, as a young man coming up in a Christian home, um, I think was an advantage. I think there's there's plenty of guys in here that have a very strong faith that didn't come up in a Christian home. So it's not a prerequisite. But I, I think, you know, me coming up the way I did and, and gaining faith early, I, I accepted Christ as my Savior when I was 14 years old. And I'll tell you, I did everything I possibly could do to avoid it. Uh, it was uh, Mount Pleasant Baptist Church. Uh, we were having a... Um, revival. It was Wednesday night. It had been Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night. God was all over me. So on Wednesday night, I did what most people do. I tried to find a way to get out of it. I, I invited two guys to go with me, and I was going to put one guy on this side and one guy on that side, which is what I did. But when that invitation that night happened, it was just like I just levitated and hit the aisle and went down and gave my life to Christ. And, and that's that was at 14. And I can tell you, uh, I, I was saved that night. It was not until I was 16 that I made the, Jesus the Lord of my life. Not until I was 16. And I'm gonna quickly tell you how that happened because my dad took me to, to Calpins High School, uh, the cafeteria, just a little bit bigger than this. But guess who was there? Bobby Richardson. So my dad took me in there to, you know, for us to go in and hear about all the great Yankee stories and all the things that Bobby did. He had an incredible career. But, you know, about three quarters of the way through that, Bobby kind of stopped and said, you know, all this stuff was great, rings, he you know, had one for every finger. You know, he said, but the most important thing in my life is my relationship with Jesus Christ. And I went, ding, ding. Because as a young man, I was confused. I was an athlete. I seemed like I couldn't find anybody who had a clean mouth. I couldn't find anybody that was trying to live like I was trying to live. And it was difficult. But it was Bobby Richardson that night that, that showed me and demonstrated to me that you can be an athlete and be a Christian. So Bobby 
he's heard that story. He knows how important he is to me. And, um, the, and, and so that early faith, I think, just followed me through my career. It kind of held me together. Uh, like I said, no perfection at all. But that, that early faith held me together and, and still does today. You spend a lot of your time coaching uh, young athletes right now that are um, really have high aspirations of, of getting better at, at baseball at the high school level or even beyond. Um, not just in hitting, not just in fielding, but talk to us about the opportunities you have to speak into their life about the importance of character. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I started giving hitting lessons when my son, Stephen, um, who was a player, uh, you know, he's a fifth round draft tour for the, for the Minnesota Twins. And he told me when he got home, he said, Dad, I, I don't want to get a job. He said, put me a cage up downstairs. I'll teach. And I think we had Ian, right? Ian actually took took lessons from Stephen tonight, came and said hello to me. And, and when Stephen left for spring training, guess who got to take over? You know, he, he kept calling me down for those guys. So anyway, um, the, the, you know, being in the basement and, and having a chance to work with kids, uh, I quickly saw, hey, here's an opportunity that I can do more and speak into their lives. So, um, you know, we, we have what we call our, our life priorities, our faith, our family, our academics, our baseball, right? and then our social life. So each time a kid comes in, we'll spend a couple minutes just taking on one of those. And so what I've, what I've learned in life is that it's not about the talent you have, it's about the person you are, That's good. the character. And so, you know, I try to, to speak into those kids' lives that, hey man, you may be the best player that ever came out of Spartanburg, but you also have to be a good person, a good solid person, a person with character. And you know, most coaches will tell you, uh, recruiting starts with talent, and it ends when they don't see character. Recruiting starts with talent, and it ends when that coach doesn't see character. And I have several stories of how that actually happened. You know, guys, one of the things about fire pit ranks that's important for you to understand is that the character that we're trying to instill in these young men uh, is something that, for many of them, it's foreign to them, okay? And so when they hear it for the very first time, it actually resonates with them. It begins to make sense because it brings structure into their life in a way that they've never known before. Uh, Jacob talked about the consistency is what would help them be successful. And so, you know, one of the reasons why we wanted Wayne to come tonight was to, for you to hear his story. And, and, uh, and we, I'm telling you, we could Q&A all night about some of the, the memories uh, from, from baseball and, and all those things. But I hope that you're hearing something in him that you and I need to be carrying out every day. We need to be looking for opportunities that we can build into the character of somebody else because not everybody else understands um, how they should live as a godly man. They may have made the faith decision, but they're not really sure what that looks like. Um, you know, so, Wayne, as we, as we begin to wrap things up, I want to say this. You, you made a, a comment uh, in our conversation, direction equals destination. Don't tell me what you've got. Show me. You said that when I, we were on the phone. And I, I mean, it just struck me. I want you to, I want you to talk to us right now. Basically, I want you to preach to us in a moment. Don't tell me, show me, because when you have a player that says, "No, I got it, I got it, I got it," you're saying, "No, no, 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 you, you show me." Yeah, exactly. Talk us through uh, that as, as men. <clears throat> those are those are two statements that are kind of weaved into my life, and, and they're accountability statements. You know, uh, as, a, as a player, you know, and, and actually really good players. I mean, we put, you know, the good Lord has been fortunate enough to lead, you know, 35, 40 guys into the college ranks out of my basement, which is awesome. And so when you're down there, and, and I have some guys with unbelievable confidence, and I have some guys that we're really trying to build the confidence for. And... <clears throat> So, you know, I learned pretty early that this is all about 
not what you say you can do, but what you can actually do. And so that, that became one of those statements that I use in my basement quite often. Uh, you may walk in one day and I'm going, show me what you got. Show me what you got. Show me what you got. Don't tell me. Show me. And they get on the tee and they go to work. And then as far as direction equals destination, again, that's an accountability statement. Um, it's something that uh, I read in a book many, 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 many years ago, and it's just it's always kind of been a part of my life, is that uh, direction equals destination. And I, I'm, 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 you know, I'm, I'm still kind of uh, awed by a GPS system, how we can plug in where we want to go, and then in two hours and 31 minutes and 20 seconds, we're there. That's pretty cool, right? But life is really that way too, is that you are stepping in a direction every day and you're heading toward a destination. The, the, the sad thing is, is that you can get to exactly where you want to be the exact same way you can get to where you don't want to be. And that's one step at a time. So we as men have to really look at, what am I stepping towards? What does that look like? You know, how is that going to affect me? How is that going to affect my family? How is that going to affect my friends? So those two statements have, have just kind of held truth in my life. You know, as we, as we close tonight, I, I want you to think about this. Guys, we're modeling for the next generation, what it looks like to be a man. And they're being inundated by information on social media. Uh, and we won't even go down that road of what they're being exposed to. Um, I want you to express your appreciation for Wayne coming tonight. And <laughs>